Hi guys, thanks for tuning in again to ForgottenWeapons.com. We are here with the very kind permission of the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana. And today we're taking a look at a pretty unusual, cool Japanese light machine gun. This is a Type 11, which is notable primarily for this guy. It has a hopper feed on it, which we'll take a look at in just a minute. Um, the Type 11 was introduced uh, into the Japanese, the Imperial Japanese Army in 1922 and uh, served as basically their first effective light machine gun. It had some really cool ideas, didn't turn out to be quite as practical as they were hoping, um, and fairly rare today. These did go on and see use through World War II. Um, they stopped manufacturing them when they replaced them with the Type 96 Nambu light machine gun, but the guns that were still in existence saw use all the way through the end of the war. So let's start by taking a look at the elephant in the room here, this big, cool, interesting hopper on the gun. The idea that they had with the Type 11 was that it would ease logistical issues by feeding from the exact same five round stripper clips that Japanese riflemen used. So they put this hopper on the side, you got a big spring loaded top cover here, and you'd put in six five round clips of 6.5 Japanese air, um, ammunition, and the gun would feed through those clips. So you could, you know, you shoot 15 rounds, lift the top up, drop three more clips in, and keep shooting. This seemed like a really cool idea. Um, obviously it makes ammunition packaging easy, it makes ammunition supply easy. The downside turned out to be that this is a very complex mechanism and uh, it was very easy to, you know, one good foot full of dirt inside there and you're going to have some serious reliability issues. It's also worth pointing out, um, this is in some ways copied from a Hotchkiss light machine gun design and it did require oiled cartridges. So this is an oil bottle on top of the gun and it would lightly oil each cartridge as it went into the chamber. Again, you add oil and then you get dust in the gun and then you have some real problems. Now, aside from the hopper, which seemed cool and turned out to have some issues, the practical design of this gun is actually a lot better than you'd expect just looking at it. Um, to start with, we'll take a look at the bipod. Uh, pretty good, good bipod design. Maybe a little bit long, but the legs fold down, pivot nice and smooth lock in place, the fairly strong bipod worked well. Now if we take a look at the stock, one of the things you'll often see in pictures of these guns is this very funky offset stock. And the idea there is twofold. First of all, it's set up to work with the offset sights, because we have a hopper on one side so we need to offset the sights, especially also with the oil bottle. This offset stock also allows all of the guts to come straight out the back of the gun. Now. What we had expected before ever actually handling one of these guns is that because of this stock it would be totally impossible to shoot left-handed and, and awkward. It turns out, in practice, if you're shooting the gun right-handed, you have your cheek here on this side of the stock and you get a very nice right-eyed sight picture. If you're left-handed, you can actually shoot the gun with your left cheek on the, the stock here and get a very good left-eyed sight picture. So this works just as well as this from the other side. Very cool, not something I expected to find on this gun. Um, with that in mind, let's go ahead and disassemble this and see how it works inside. For being a relatively early gun, um, it's definitely an extremely expensive gun to manufacture. There's a ton of milling and a lot of work that went into making the parts on this. It's, it's not your, your late war stamped type construction. However, it goes together pretty simply. So the first step in disassembly here is to actually remove the entire hopper mechanism from the side of the gun. That's done very simply. We have a single spring-loaded catch here on the side. Push that back. And then I can pull out this entire mechanism. We'll take a closer look at the mechanism after we get the rest of the gun apart. Next, we have a pivoting pin. We pull the cap out, rotate it down. This pin comes out, and then the rear end of the receiver comes off. You can see that because of the offset stock, I can pull this straight out the back of the gun. This has basically just a, a very machining heavy guide for the recoil spring. We pull our charging handle back. This is a non-reciprocating charging handle. Charging handle comes out. 
and then the bolt and op rod both come out the back of the gun. So this is obviously gas operated, gas piston here. This groove and track is for operating the hopper, which we'll look at, like I said. And then we have a bolt that detaches, kind of similar in style to a Bren, except the way that this locks is that this rear locking block, when the gun is in battery, the locking block drops down. These two locking shoulders lock into recesses in the receiver here and on the opposite side. See there's a little screw and a cover. That's so you can remove this cover to have access um, to the locking shoulders. Then our firing pin is right here. And what happens is, so the bolt travels like this with the locking piece raised. As it goes into battery, the locking piece drops and you can see the firing pin, this square firing pin right at the back there. As the bolt goes all the way back onto the op rod, that depresses the firing pin, which fires the gun. When the gas piston, the gas hits the gas piston, forces the whole thing back, it cams the locking, the locking, wet, locking block up, out of battery, then the whole thing can travel backwards and repeat the cycle. A lot of machining operations, but a pretty pretty elegant design in there. Now, less elegant is the hopper here. This guy has this main operating piece, and that block so this block runs in that slot. So as the operating rod goes backward and forward, it pulls this piece side to side. And if we look inside there, you can see that it, what it does, it goes back, it drops these four fingers to hold cartridges at full extension, it snaps over, and then as I pull, so I'm pulling this piece out, the cartridge guides lift up, grab the cartridges, which are fixed in a clip, pull them laterally, one cartridge over, then at this point, those stop moving, but the cartridge currently being fed continues, and it's pulled out and dropped into this feed tray right here, where the bolt then picks it up, chambers it, and fires it. At that point, the gas piston starts going backwards, the cartridge fingers drop down, they get pushed back to their original starting point, and then come up again. Three. So as you can see, as I pull this back and forth, we have a little block on the back of the, the mechanism here that travels in a circle. This is a very smooth operating system, at least on this particular gun. Um, the machining that went into this was very precise. They work great, I'm sure, on a nice static range. The problem is it doesn't take much dirt in that to really screw it up. Um, one last element to point out. In order to disassemble this mechanism, there's a little locking piece here. We just slide that up. And then we can push this spring-loaded button in. Push that in and then we can pull or push all of the little guts of this mechanism out through the side, which I'm not going to do because I think that would probably be a nightmare to try and reassemble. And that's here on a museum examining table. You can only imagine what happens if you have to disassemble that to clean it on, say, Iwo Jima in volcanic dust. Um, one last thing to point out here. And the Japanese did this on the Nambu series of machine guns, the 96 and the 99, as well as the Type 11. This big, huge lever here is actually the ejector. It runs on a cam in the bolt. So the ejector runs on here with this back hook so that when there's, there's positive force on the ejector, when the bolt is at the proper position back, the ejector is cammed up and it's got this big, basically, hammer finger that smacks cartridges out of the action. Not fragile, reliable, 
really pretty cool and it makes for an interesting thing that you can watch when the gun's shooting because it's woodpeckering back and forth. So if we're ready to fire, we go ahead and open the hopper, drop in 30 rounds, six stripper clips, close the hopper, put spring pressure on them, draw the charging handle back, locks the bolt open, push the handle forward to its normal position. Gun is now ready to fire. We do have a safety. This is actually not a bad safety at all. That's safe. There's no way you're going to misinterpret that because especially if you're right-handed, it thoroughly blocks the trigger guard. So we flip up for fire, and we're ready to go. One other cool feature, fairly modern feature of the Type 11, is it does have an adjustable gas system. We have a plunger in here. Pull out and rotate. This one, unfortunately, is frozen up, but the idea is open this, and you can rotate this knurled knob to adjust uh, the amount of gas getting into the piston. and then lock it back down. So overall, the Type 11 is a really good example of an early light machine gun. It had a lot of very good features, it had a lot of clever features, and it had modern features to it, but those were kind of mixed in with some experimental ideas that seemed good, but nobody had really tried, primarily this hopper, um, also the oiling system. So uh, th this was a period in the 19 teens and the 1920s where people were experimenting with new designs, trying to figure out what was going to be the best way to build a light machine gun. And the Type 11 is a, a perfect example of something that was great in some ways and terrible in other ways. Um, it did serve the Japanese army well through all of World War II, but uh, there were definitely better things that came after it. So I think this is a particularly cool gun because it's funky and weird and unusual. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at it. Tune back into ForgottenWeapons.com for more early light machine guns. You could shoot this thing offhand if it had some way to hold it. Which it doesn't. <laughs>